and my insert just broke. I had the speed a little bit too high. It's a very expensive piece to be making mistakes like that. This material is wasp alloy. It's a material that you see all the time in aerospace applications, and this is actually my first time running it. I've ran materials similar to this, like Inconel and Hastelloy, and we used to run those all the time back in the day when we did aerospace parts. But this is my first time running this particular one. Running tough materials like this can be intimidating, but like my dad always says, speeds and feeds are king. With the right ingredients, the right speeds and feeds, it'll set you up for success. And that's what I'm gonna to give to you in this video. Today out of this wasp alloy, I'm gonna be making an aerospace fastener, the type you would see all the time on aircraft. And on the end of it, it's gonna have an eight point bolt pattern on it. So let's see what it can do. So I had the camera guys film our aluminum setup piece. Just because I thought it'd be a good idea since I can run it without coolant and you'd be able to see the tool pass a little bit easier but I did change up a few of the passes afterwards, so there might be a few differences. So the first tool we're running is a CNMG 433 rougher, and this is a KCS 10B insert. It's really good on super alloys like Inconel, Monel, and Wasp alloy. So I'll play the preview here. We're gonna face the part, and then we're gonna rough out the OD. The OD rougher goes a little bit past the overall length of the part, and that's just to give us a nice clean surface when we part off the part. And I also programmed a small little taper into the roughing pass, just because the option was there in Mastercam, and I was hoping that it would help with tool life. My insert just broke. I had the speed a little bit too high, 170 was a bit too much. So let's drop the speed and give it another go. For this tool, I'm running it at 110 SFM with a feed rate of 11 thousandths per revolution and a depth of cut of 0 0.11, 110 thousandths. I swear it's because it actually worked and it's not just because I like the number one that those speeds and feeds are there. We actually were playing around with a few different ones and that's where we ended up with. You can also see in Mastercam that that little taper that I have, that's this variable depth of cut that we have programmed in. So I have it programmed for 30% of the depth. That roughing pass is probably the heaviest amount of work that gets done on this part. And afterwards, we have a lot of smaller tool paths going on and finishing passes. All of that work gets done right off of the bat, and then we have our finish pass right afterwards. So the next tool we're running is a CNMG 431 finisher, and that's also a KCS 10B insert. For the speeds and feeds, I'm running it at 120 SFM with a feed rate of 2 thousandths per revolution. Just a hair quicker on the spindle speed, but we dropped the feed rate all the way down to get a good finish. Standard finishing pass, we face the part, turn across the whole OD. I don't have the OD tool going quite as far as the roughing pass. It just turns across the top portion right here. And that's because we're gonna be roughing out all that other material on the second side. I just wanted the rougher to turn past it just so we had a nice clean surface for the part off tool, but the finish pass can stop right there. This tool is one of Kenna Metal's standard threading inserts, but it is a full pitch insert. It's designed for this thread. The thread I'm running is a 1 in 1 8 12 UNJ thread. So this insert is a 12 pitch UNJ insert. So this threader is running at 225 RPM, which puts it at about 80 SFM. It's running specifically for the feed rate of the insert. For the feed rate, we divide one divided by 12, which gives us 83 thousandths per revolution. Mastercam puts that in automatically when you select what thread you're doing. You can see on this page, we have all of our thread dimensions here. We're doing a 12 pitch thread, major and minor diameter. That's all set. So I have the thread parameters set at equal depth, and for number of cuts, I selected 24 cuts. We're going on the lighter side because of how hard this material is and because the threading pass goes a little bit fast.
after that tool, we have our part off tool and we're going to be doing our chuck transfer along with it. So we're going to have the chuck come in, grab our part, and then we're going to have the tool come in and part it off. Mastercam has the option to do that here under part handling and then you can select pick off and cut off. So it combines the pick off operations with the part off operation. I've covered chuck transfers before in our previous videos. The one thing that's new when you select that is that you have a lathe point operation here and that's to bring the part off tool above the point where it's going to part off. When you do chuck transfers, you already have the top or bottom turret moving out of the way for the second chuck to come in to grab onto the part. But now we called up a specific tool and we have offsets in there to put that tool at the point where it's ready to part off. So I just made sure that I select what tool I'm running and make sure my tool angle is set so the tool is vertical and flipped in the right direction. And then you can see in our pickoff operations down here, we have our actual cutoff operation. So this just continues off from where we set it. We make sure we have our actual speeds and feeds in there. So I'm running it at 100 SFM with a feed rate of one and a half thousandths per revolution. And I also put a peck cycle in this part off tool just because I was a little bit worried about the part off tool. It's a good insert, it would have been able to handle it, but I didn't want a long stringy chip because I was running that tool a little bit slow. So I have a peck every 25 thousandths with a retract of 25 thousandths. One thing with the chuck transfer is when you have that second chuck starting to get involved and you have a tool in between those two chucks, your clearances start to get a little sketchy. Yes! Now I could have turned, and you've seen Travis do it on, sometimes on his machine, where he turns the second side jaws on the OD, it gives him a little bit of room. But for what I was doing, I don't even think even doing that would have given me the clearances I wanted. So what I did was on the chuck transfer, it's only grabbing on to the front part of the OD. But then after it's all done with the chuck transfer, I had a pause in my program to where I unclamp the part and I shove it all the way back into the jaws. I can do this on this part because I don't have any milling operations or anything that needs to be clocked specifically to any features that were done in op one. the second side we pretty much go back to our first two tools pretty much the same as op one we're doing a few more facing passes because i parted this off a little bit long just to give myself some extra material so i didn't have to worry about it those are running at the same speeds and feeds as op one so we got the 110 sfm feed rate of 11 thousandths for the face pass we're doing 40 thousandths face passes and then for the roughing pass 110 for the depth of cut same speeds and feeds same speeds and feeds, but it's not going as deep. It's only doing that front portion. So not as much stress being put on that tool as the first side. Afterwards, we have our finish pass again, same speeds and feeds as before, 120 SFM with a feed rate of 2000s per revolution, facing the part and then turning the OD. So one thing that was a little bit different on OP2, I mentioned about clearances, and it was something that only really popped into my head when I was in the middle of doing OP2, was that, is that my tool on op two was going to hit if I machine to center point 
and when I go into the part. And that's because I had the tool vertical like I like to do. Now I mentioned before, turning the jaws, that probably could have helped with my clearances. But the only thing that I could do with this machine, just so I didn't have to turn the jaws and be a little bit lazy, I just tilt the tool. So I have the bottom turret out of the way anyway. We tilt the tool horizontally and we make sure our spindle direction is spinning in the direction that we need to cut for our insert. So we're actually using an M4 to spin it backwards. And it's doing the exact same thing as before, but now the tool is horizontal. You set that all up in your tool angle in Mastercam. So you can see here we have our tool angle set at 180 degrees and our tool orientated 180 degrees. As long as your tool is drawn right in Mastercam, it'll spin the spindle in the proper direction depending on what you set that tool orientation at. So after that tool, we have our milling operations. We're all done with the turning on it. And for the roughing operation, I'm using a quarter inch Harvey One TE. I programmed a 2D dynamic milling roughing pass and we got our tool horizontal. I'm running it at 120 SFM with a feed rate of 1000 per tooth. And this is a four flute in mill. So that puts us at about seven inches per minute with a spindle speed of 1800 RPM. Programming it, I did a 5% step over. That puts it at about 0 0.0125, which doesn't seem like a whole lot, but we're going full depth on the tool. And then after it does one flute, we're gonna rotate it and work on the next portion. We're just roughing them out one at a time. So it'll do one portion of the star and then rotate eight times around the part. For this toolpath, I'm using a tapered Harvey 3 ball nose end mill. So it's a 1 8 ball mill with a 3 8 shank, so it's tapered. Going 150 SFM with a feed rate of 6 tenths per tooth. It puts it at about 16 inches per minute with a spindle speed of 4,500 RPM. And how we have this program is that the tool's gonna come in at a 45 degree angle and the part is going to spin around and it's gonna finish the whole star pattern of that nut that I have on the front of the part. The way we did it was we made a morph toolpath in Mastercam and I actually created some extra surfaces and separated the geometry of that star pattern and extended it out a little bit. But you can see here, we have our surfaces. It perfectly follows that pattern. The tool locks into place and it's just going constantly around the part. I have the step over at 3 thousandths, which is a little bit overkill, but I wanted a good surface finish on this nut. thing I do with this tool is I make one more stock model after I do the finishing of the OD of that nut and that's just to get rid of the little bit of stock that's left on the wall. So I have a unified guide path and this tool just comes at an angle all around the part and it just kisses the wall and this is just to match up with the previous turned work that we did before the milling operation. So we're just cleaning up that surface between the milling and the lathe and giving it a nice flat surface. Same speeds and feeds, same step over as the previous pass. And after that, our part's complete.
know that I was making a wasp alloy fastener. It was really fun machining wasp alloy, a material I've never done before, and it had its own challenges, but I was able to use a lot of the experience I had cutting Inconel and apply it to wasp alloy. I will say, just like Inconel, it's just as unforgiving when you're playing around with the roughing passes trying to get a good roughing pass because of the work hardening. So once you have your speeds and feeds dialed in, it's really smooth, but at first when you're still playing around with the material, trying to figure out where to cut it at, it, it's a headache. We had the coolant running a lot on the wasp alloy. Having the Aero X Misfit get rid of all of that nastiness inside the machine really helped out. So shout out to them. Like this video, subscribe to our channel. Let me know in the comments if there's any kinds of materials you want to see me run or any crazy parts you want to see. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.